Growing up, I never thought I'd be homeless. I never thought I'd be addicted to drugs. I never thought I'd contract HIV. I never thought I'd be short, fat, bald. Last month of my addiction, I was arrested three times in two separate counties and I was booked on 17 felonies into Santa Cruz County Jail. So from a girl who grew up in a conservative home having never been in trouble before, I sure went down a different path than I ever thought my life would take. Kind of difficult growing up because to go from a house to the corner store, it would be an obstacle without being hidden up by a gang member asking me questions, you know, are you in, are you out, or somebody doing drugs. I have 20 years of, you know, on and off heroin addiction. Um, so it started behind like a life of childhood trauma uh, and abuse. And you know what, I can live with short, fat, and bald and having HIV. Um, and I can live being a recovering drug addict today. Uh, all my life, I always ran away from pain. You know, growing up, my safe spot was underneath the kitchen table where my dad couldn't reach me. He couldn't beat me under the table. Uh, I would sometimes dart from the table to save my mom and take a hit or two for her. She'd leave me with the babysitter, a 17-year-old kid, and uh, he did things to me that I, that still scar me today. I found something that took away the pain and it was meth, you know, and I didn't realize that meth was going to take me down a long journey of more pain. Before I knew it, I heard the gavel go down, Mr. Rodriguez, you're going to be three years in prison. Before I knew it, I was just like, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. That wasn't what my mom came here for. Those weren't the values of morals that she established in my life. I felt disappointed. I let my mom down, my community, people down. So I rebelled and ended up going to prison when I was 18. And rather than me, you know, learning my lesson or in coming home, it, it corrupted me more going to state prison. It's a very negative atmosphere. You know, it's a really negative atmosphere. And I came home a little bit more, you know, worse off than when I entered. Over half of the people that we incarcerate um, have been to prison three or four times. So if we're really serious about reducing crime, if we're really serious about public safety, then we have to start thinking much more seriously about investing in re-entry. I, I think it is our obligation uh, to give them some services uh, so that when they leave our facilities that they have treatment under their belt, they have education. Trying to give these people some skills and some tools uh, so that when they leave our facilities, they don't reoffend or, or they're less likely to reoffend. I've heard some people from the community say that these programs uh, show that we're weak, that we're, that we're coddling this group. But when you think about what recidivism reduction does in crime control, it's a huge piece of our crime control model. If we can get people to not reoffend when they come back, that's less crime that's occurring out on the street. The staff here has been supportive beyond means. Um, they've created a safe place for me to do that. It's, I still get a little choked up about it. But, um, so the support that they give me is like um, not nothing I'm used to from growing up. So they've seen something in me that I don't see in myself. They've helped me to, to develop tools and to give the right mindset. Really, we are here to help with whatever we can help with. We're not here to lock people up, turn the key and lock them, leave them in there. If you can just see a little bit of a change in them and encourage them to keep going in that direction as an officer to an inmate, I see a change in you and I like what I see. Keep doing it, you're on the right track. You're, you know, you're getting it. Congratulations. It goes a long ways.
one week before I paroled, I was like, you know what, Guillermo, give yourself an opportunity. Go to a program because if you go back to your neighborhood of gangs and violence and drugs, you're going to do the same shit. I never really set aside that time to kind of take a look at myself and what I had been through and, and maybe why I was making these decisions or why I was okay with harming myself. People that love themselves don't shoot heroin. And I really you know, had to look at what I needed to do in my life and what needed to change. And so from that moment forward, I went to a meeting a day in the county jail. I joined the Gemma Day program, which is funded through Encompass. And from there, my life really started to change. And currently, I'm managing that house. I live with 12 other women in recovery, and I get to see them grow every day. They do things like get their children back, or they move out and they get their houses and their families back together, or they get these amazing jobs. She shows other women in early recovery that they can do it, you know, that it is, um, we can um, live normal lives, we can have um, healthy relationships, we can find um, good jobs with um, employers who trust us today. All the community groups I talk to, they're tired of seeing the chronic alcoholics in the parks. They're tired of seeing the drinking and the behavior. They're, ti they're tired of uh, cars getting broken into and, and things stolen out of garages. So I think we really need to focus on that real lower, lower end offender um, population and not throw them in jail, but trying to get them into services and stop that behavior. What I do see here is a lot of people coming in and out, and a lot of the guys live in little, in the street basically. They live in cardboard houses, and so I think if they had more housing um, jobs, I think it would be better for them and they wouldn't be here. They'd probably be out there working and paying their bills. We're trying to line up things, obviously, before they, they come out because the 28 to 48 hours immediately after release is a really, really significant time where you want to engage that person, get things lined up. You don't want them coming back and not having a home because they can quickly drift off. When you're, you enter a plea or you're found guilty um, to a charge, you're sentenced with jail or probation or prison or whatever, fees and fines, that's your sentence. The collateral consequences are everything that happens after you're done serving your sentence. Finding employment and having your record come up in a background check, that's a collateral consequence. Trying to find housing and having the barrier of your record come up in those background checks. Not having the ability to pay your fees and fines and having a hold placed on your driver's license so then you can't get yourself to and from work in order to pay off your fees and fines, those are collateral consequences. Um, and th that's just a few. So rather than cycling in and out of jail, I would love to see our community really get behind a program that funnels these folks into treatment, into jobs, into some, some sort of positive pro-social behavior uh, to get them off the street and, and away from, from the addiction that is really fueling a lot of their behaviors. You know, and sometimes it'd be like, do I get a um, double or do I put the extra dollar and get a 20 sack? Which way do I go? And today it's like, let me show you. Today, today I have money in my pocket. It's a hundred dollars, guys. Look, I have money in my pocket today. I have a job today. Because of my in and out of jail, um, I wasn't in any good standings with the union. So through that program, they've helped me to get in good standings with the union. And I mean, that's major to get out and have, you know, the sky's the limit attitude to go back to work, to have the housing, to, to have these benefits, and just to know that people are behind us, that people believe in us, that are standing by us is just, it's indescribable, the feeling, you know? So you don't get that going to prison. Just people are going to make mistakes and we're all imperfect. And I think that some mistakes are greater than others. Some mistakes go unnoticed. Some people are caught for their mistakes and some people end up paying a hefty price for their mistake. And I think that, um, you know, if for employers, I think maybe just taking a look within themselves and trying to relate to the applicant on a personal level and maybe just um, being willing to give that person a chance. I've seen generations of people come through here. I've seen fathers, mothers, sons and daughters and their children uh, in my 25 years. So it's, it's a continual, uh, unfortunate uh, cycle that people go through. I don't want to have to live like this anymore. I don't want to have to 
show my kids that I, I gave up on them. I, my daughter is 13 years old and my son is 11 and I have never been part of their lives. Being able to be clean today, I've actually been able to have a, a life with them. You know, they come to visit me in all my prison history and all my jail incarcerations. I have never received like not one visit, not one letter. Is what about the families? You know, they're left behind sometimes, and we don't help them. We don't have any programs to support and help the families. So maybe that's another thing that we should look into. You know, for us to have these guys be successful when they're out there. Ideally, the, the, the folks, the community can accept people. Um, they've, they've done their time. Remember, the, the, the system held them accountable, so to speak. So they've been away for years. And let's not make, uh, make them now the victims once they come back. And I think it's really critical for us as a community to, to, to understand that. And in order to do that, they need jobs. They need people to believe in them. They need you know, further education. So the doors need to be open for them. If we actually want these people to get out, of, from, out from underneath the system and find jobs and support their families and not go back in, we have to allow them the opportunity to do that. I graduated. I'm part of the Santa Cruz Speaker Bureau. I have goals. I have dreams today. I don't live in a nightmare anymore. I have two friends that want to see me make it today. I think we're in a really exciting time in terms of in terms of re-entry policy. I think it's becoming a really big issue at the state level, also at the federal level. And I think we're really starting to look at the rate at which we're incarcerating people in this country, um, whether that's a productive use of our resources. Really, whatever vantage point you're looking at, what we're doing now isn't working. So we have to come up with something else that's more sustainable um, and more, inf more effective in terms of preventing people from recidivating and coming back through the system over and over again. I've been dealing with this stuff, learning about it, studying it since 1973. And we're at a critical point right now, an inflection point where things seem to be changing and people seem to be finally learning on all sides of the political spectrum uh, that we're not going to incarcerate our, our way out of these problems. So when about half of uh, the people who are in jail, uh, in prison, um, have been there three times before, uh, when two out of three of them uh, are going to return, uh, and it's costing us $45,000 per year per inmate, um, we need to be doing something differently. We need to be investing in re-entry, providing the services that people need, to go straight, to become productive members of society.